All right, in this video, I'm gonna walk you through how to accurately sketch a polynomial that's written in factored form like this one using its degree, its leading coefficient, its x-intercepts, the order of its x-intercepts, and its y-intercept. But before we get into it, be sure to sketch the graph of the like button down below so that other people can discover this beautiful process as well. Now, one of the simplest and most important pieces of information we can gain from a polynomial that's written in factored form is the degree of the polynomial. Normally, when a polynomial is written in standard form, the degree is gonna be the highest power on x. But when we're looking at a polynomial that's been written in factored form like this, we have a degree of one on each of these x's. And that's okay, what we can do to find the degree is just count up the number of x's that we have. And in this case, we have one, two, three x's. And you can kind of picture if I was gonna expand and simplify the product of these three binomials, the highest power I would have on x would be x to the power of three, right? x times x times x is x to the power of three. So I'm gonna say that the degree of this polynomial is gonna be three. That's the first key piece of information that we need to create a sketch of this polynomial. Now, if you've ever seen a degree three polynomial before, they all kind of have a similar shape. A degree three polynomial is a cubic function, and there's two possible ways a cubic can look on a graph. Without getting into accuracy here, you've probably seen cubics that look either something like this or something like this. They either start in quadrant three and end in quadrant one, or they start in quadrant two and end in quadrant four. So at this point, all we really know about this degree three polynomial is that it's gonna take the general shape of one of these two cubics. But let's start narrowing it down. And that's where the leading coefficient, the LC, is gonna come in. Now the leading coefficient is going to be the coefficient on the term that has the highest power on x. Now, since we haven't actually expanded this out and simplified, we can't really just look at that highest power. But what we can do is look right here and see that we're multiplying this entire expression by a negative one. So I'm not actually interested in the value of my leading coefficient. I'm more interested in the sign of the leading coefficient. And in this case, we're working with a negative number. Now that negative leading coefficient is gonna tell me that we're working with a cubic that behaves like this one right here, starting in quadrant two, ending in quadrant four. Now a cubic function with a positive leading coefficient would start in quadrant three and end in quadrant one like this one. But we know since we're working with a leading coefficient that is negative, our graph has to take the general shape of this cubic right here, starting in quadrant two, ending in quadrant four. So what I'm gonna do here is just replace that rough general sketch with two arrows that are gonna indicate the end behavior of my polynomial. I know that as I move in this direction, in the negative x values, I'm going off to positive infinity. And as I move in the positive direction, I'm heading off towards negative infinity. And that's what we've determined so far, just by looking at our degree and our leading coefficient. The rest of the stuff, the accurate stuff in the middle, we're gonna start filling in by looking at our x-intercepts. All right, so x-intercepts happen when the value of y is equal to zero. So I could set this entire function equal to zero and just solve for the values of x that make that function equal to zero. Now, the easiest way to do that, since we're working factored form here, is to just look at each one of these sets of brackets and ask yourself what x value makes each of those equal to zero. As it turns out, the x value that makes each of these sets of brackets equal to zero will just be the opposite sign of the second term, right? So if I put negative one in for x in this first set of brackets, I'm gonna get zero, right? So I've got negative one, two, and three as my x-intercepts. And I'm gonna go ahead and plot those on my graph here so I can really start coming up with an accurate sketch of what this polynomial is gonna look like, right? So I've got, a, I've got an x-intercept at negative one, I've got an x-intercept at two, and I've got an x-intercept right here at three. Now let's talk about this order business because this is something that I think a lot of people overlook, but it's actually really helpful when it comes to really understanding what the sketch of your polynomial is gonna look like. So we can use the word order to describe the behavior of the function at the x-intercept. Each of these x-intercepts is going to have an order of one. And the reason for that is if you look back at our original function, we have sort of an imaginary one as a power on each of our sets of brackets, okay? That's what is going to tell us what the order of our x-intercept is. So if I have an order one x-intercept, there's gonna be a one there. An order two x-intercept, there'd be an exponent of two here, for example. Order three would be an exponent of three and so on. And I'm gonna have some videos on those higher order x-intercepts that you can check out if you're interested. But for now, we're working with an order one x-intercept in all cases here. So let's talk about what an order one x-intercept looks like. On a graph, an order one x-intercept means we're just gonna pass through our x-intercept. And you might be thinking, what else could possibly happen at an x-intercept? Well, an order two x-intercept would look something like this, where we sort of bounce off the x-axis. An order three x-intercept looks sort of like this, where it sort of sits on the x-axis, but we're working with an order one x-intercept in all cases here. So at each of our x-intercepts, our function is going to pass through the x-axis, okay? So I'm gonna draw that just like this. I know at those points, my function's going to pass directly through the x-axis. All right, so that's the order. 
So we've got a degree three polynomial, a negative leading coefficient. We've got order one X intercepts at negative one, two, and three. The last thing we need here is our Y intercept. And the Y intercept we know happens when the value of X is equal to zero. So I can just put zero in for X in each of these sets of brackets, multiply everything together. And to save you some time, we have a Y intercept at negative six. So I'm gonna plot that on my graph. The X value at the Y intercept is going to be zero. I'm gonna head down to negative six and plot a point right there. And at this point, we have all the information we need to create a relatively accurate sketch of what this polynomial is going to look like. And to create that sketch, all I really need to do is sort of connect all of these pieces of information that I've put on my graph. So I'm going to start up in quadrant two, and I'm going to slowly work my way down to that first X intercept. I'm going to pass through it and I'm going to keep on going down to my Y intercept. Now I'm at that Y intercept. I have to somehow get back up to that X intercept at two. So I'm going to spin around and come right back up and I'm going to pass through that X intercept. I'm going to bounce back around again, pass through the next X intercept at three. And I'm going to come all the way back down to join my function in that quadrant four, where I know I'm heading based on the fact that I'm working with a degree three polynomial with a negative leading coefficient. So I've just went ahead and cleaned that sketch up a little bit to get rid of some of those preliminary sketches that I made. Now I am well aware that this is not a perfectly accurate sketch of this cubic function. If we are aiming for absolute perfection, we could of course use the fact that this is a function and just sort of substitute any given X value into that function, get the corresponding Y value out and plot it on the graph. And that will help us nail down some of the points on our graph that aren't necessarily 100% accurate. Outside of that, we could of course use calculus to find the critical points of this function and plot the local maximum minimum, but that is beyond the scope of this video. Now, the next thing you wanna do is you wanna head over to this video right here so that you can take a look at an example that involves an order two X intercept, and I will see you there.